the radio, 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 hi ho the radio, the radio to you. Hi, this is Frank Brzee with Edgar Bergen, Charlie McCarthy, and Fred Allen on the golden days of radio. He said, did anyone in your family ever suffer from insanity? I said, no, they all seem to enjoy it. Oh, gee, Corliss, nobody makes me feel like you do. How is that? Like I tingle all over. Well, we do have a fun show for you tonight, so settle back, relax, get those imaginations working, and most importantly, enjoy. Frank Brzee was a man of many talents. He was a writer, producer, entertainer, entrepreneur, and visionary. But perhaps he will be most remembered as one of the world's most notable radio historians and collector of memories from the golden days of radio. Phineas Franklin Brzee was born on August 20th, 1929. His parents, Esther and Horace, adored their first child. They lived in an upscale neighborhood in Los Angeles, and the family kept a very active social life. As a young boy, Franklin and his younger brother, Alan, loved the outdoors. They would often visit their favorite places in Malibu, Big Bear, and Catalina Island. Frank developed an interest in radio at an early age. And after he and his fellow classmates took a field trip to their local radio station, KFAC, he fell in love with the broadcast medium. He began collecting radio scripts and transcription discs, which planted the seeds for a rich and rewarding career. In high school, Frank was active in school plays and performances. He was very outgoing and loved talking to people. You know, he was like he was born with a microphone in his hand. <laughs> and that was his personality. He was, he was uh, very active in anything socially and uh, he was a very popular kid. I don't think there was anybody that disliked Frank. He had the kind of personality that you couldn't help but like. He was very worldly and funny and intimidated the heck out of me. Frank actually started working in radio in 1939. And in 1942, he landed his first regular role on the popular Western show, Red Rider. He shared duties with his friend Tommy Cook, playing the character of Little Beaver. Red Rider would say, come on, thunder. And then Little Beaver would say, get him up, Papoose. And that's the way we started every show. Frank also played Little Alvin on the major Hoople radio program. That show featured two experienced actors who played an important part in Frank's life, Arthur Q. Bryan and Mel Blanc. Frank was very close to Arthur Q. Bryan, who was the voice that said, who was Elmer Fudd, and he would go, ah, 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 you know, and Elmer Fudd and Blank was he. Uh, but Frank was very close to him. They, I think Arthur kind of took him under his wing a little bit and showed them the ropes when Frank first started working as a child actor. Mel Blanc was another famous Warner Brothers character voice, and he and Frank developed a lifelong relationship, helping one another on projects through the years. Here's a clip from a 1980 Command performance show. This person delighted thousands with her. Any bonds today? Bonds of freedom, that's what I'm selling. Any bonds today? That's Bugs Bunny! Hey, hey, hey. Bugs, what are you doing here? Well, I came here to help you salute American Forces Radio and Television Service. Uh, but, Bugs, we didn't plan on using you. We wanted to use this lovely, talented singer. No, no, hold, hold it, Doc, hold it, Doc. I, I can sing for you. Sing? You sure. sing? Look, Bugs, we can't use you. You can't use me? Well, what about Daffy Duck? Daffy Duck? Yes, <laughs> sir, you're, you're darn tootin' Daffy <laughs> Duck. That's me, too. <laughs> Daffy Duck, isn't it? You know, just a minute there, Buster. Don't you think I got class, too? <laughs> it's not that, Daffy. It's just that we didn't plan on having you on this show. Oh, you didn't plan on having us on your show, eh? 
I never heard of such a thing. I am mortified. Well, Bugs, it's just that we don't know what you could possibly do. Uh, hold, I say, hold on there, son. Yeah, hold on. <laughs> it's Foghorn Leghorn. Yeah, now, 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 listen. Listen here, son. You, you give that, I say, you give, uh, you give that rabbit a part in this show or else hey, I'll... Hey, look, Hog Foghorn. <laughs> <laughs> we can't let Bugs sing. We don't have an orchestra. We don't have a band leader. We don't have anything that we need for the song. Well, uh, then you don't have us. Come on, fellas. Let's get out of here. Tell them goodbye, Porky. That's all, folks. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mel Black. In 1949, Frank returned to one of his favorite childhood vacation places, Santa Catalina Island, and started up the island's first radio station. The call letters were KSCI. Frank would host live band remotes from Avalon's beautiful casino ballroom, but his best memory came on his very first day of work, introducing Jan Garber and his orchestra. Out of the night to you comes music from the land of enchantment, Santa Catalina Island. From the beautiful Catalina Casino Ballroom, high above the twinkling lights of Romantic Avalon and the harbor, KSCI sends your way the music of the idol of the air lanes, Jan Garber and his orchestra. It was Jan Garber who inspired Frank to play back some of his collection of archived radio programs on the air. And a few days later, the golden days of radio program was born. After three years on the island, Frank returned to Los Angeles and started working for Jim Hawthorne to help with his new television show. Frank wrote segments and created voice tracks for Jim's freeform program. From there, Frank went to work for Johnny Grant. Long before Johnny was recognized as the honorary mayor of Hollywood, he was a radio personality and television producer. He worked as a late-night DJ at the famous Ham and Egger Diner, and his show ran from midnight to 3 a.m. Frank stepped in and hosted the last hour of the program. Johnny was good friends with a number of celebrities, and he was the one that introduced Frank to Bob Hope. By that time, Bob had already built a successful career in radio, and had starred in a number of films that were shot at Paramount Studios. Paramount didn't have an audio recording studio on the lot. They did films. They didn't do radio. And Hope didn't have the time uh, to go to a recording studio to do this. So whenever he had to do recorded spots, he or Johnny Grant would call me and say, take your tape recorder and go over to Bob Hope's dressing room and record these radio spots. And I had a very good a magna quarter tape recorder and a very good microphone, so the quality of my recordings was great. And I loved that. He was really very, very nice and very helpful to me and very courteous to me. When I turned 21, I got my draft notice to go down and take my physical. Bob Hope found out about it and uh, he wrote me a letter that said I was essential to him for uh, the armed forces and for all kinds of things. That letter turned out to be effective as Frank received his notice from the Selective Service Agency indicating that he did not need to serve. Several years later, he collaborated with columnist and commentator Walter Winchell to produce an album showcasing the life of Al Jolson. This is a love letter from the American people to Broadway's greatest showman, Al Jolson. It was a great success. Winchell was so happy with that, he said, why don't we do other show business uh, personalities? And I said, well, who do you suggest? He said, how about Jimmy Durante? So he called Durante. And so Durante and Winchell and I got together and wrote the script. And Durante even came down to the Hudson studio, down to the theater, and recorded some special music for me for the album. This is Walter Winchell, and this is the legend of Jimmy Durante. Much like the Jolson album, The Legend of Jimmy Durante was a biographical radio album narrated by Walter Winchell, 
and featured a number of excerpts that Frank had collected from Durante's past performances. All night, I could have danced all night. Frank's next album featured the work of Eddie Cantor, which was narrated by Eddie's best friend, George Jessel. Eddie Cantor. One of the greatest stars to ever shine in the constellation known as show business. George Jessel was so good that I said, I want to do an album called George Jessel Presents This Is My Show Business, where you talk about all the stars you knew from uh, 1900 on, from the beginning of Vaudeville. And, uh, and then we'll play a little excerpt of each one. And he thought that was a great idea. So Frank continued to strengthen his professional relationships as he further developed his reputation in show business. The era known as the golden days of radio began in the late 1920s, and for several decades, families would gather around their radios and tune into their favorite shows. It was the primary form of home entertainment. Names like Rudy Valley, Amos and Andy, and Feber Biggie and Molly became commonplace around homes during the early days. Noted writers like Norman Corwin and Arch Obler brought us radio dramas, while reporters like Lowell Thomas and Edward R. Murrow delivered us the news. Radio was a vital part of the American culture, and Frank Brzee understood its historical significance. That's part of what drove Frank to collect and preserve radio memories. Frank was probably one of the most avid collectors in the collecting community. He was collecting before people were collecting. He was, because he would, he would go after a show, he would go and look in the trash to see He was one of the first dumpster divers, yeah. really, if you look <laughs> going back to the 1940s, but not Before for what people... Yeah, he's, he was looking for the scripts and the transcription discs. Transcription discs were used to record early radio programs, long before tape recorders were put into use. They were larger than regular record albums and held about 15 minutes per side. When we first started, uh, people like Frank Brzee, myself, and a few other collectors would actually go around to the radio stations and we would ask them, do you have any transcription discs? In most cases, they say, well, yeah, we were just going to throw these out. And uh, if you want them, you can have them. And uh, we would get a lot of programs that way. Frank's personal collection fed his Golden Days of Radio program and it quickly gained in popularity. It was heard nationally on the Liberty Broadcasting System for several years, and then in 1967, it was picked up by the Armed Forces Radio and Television Service and was broadcast to over 400 stations in over 30 countries. Frank created over 2,700 shows during his 29-year relationship with the Armed Forces Network. We had the largest library of the giant transcriptions of old radio shows that went all the way back to the, to the Second World War. The military wanted to throw them all away because they had no particular value anymore. One day the Sergeant Major says to me, there's a guy coming over from Hollywood. He does this show for us, this Golden Days of Radio thing, and he plays all those old shows on this. And a few days later I met Frank for the first time. He came in and uh, sat down and he was there for several months and we literally listened probably to every single piece of vinyl that was at AFN. It became fodder for golden days of radio for years and years to follow. Over time, as Frank built his reputation, he would interview many radio celebrities and would incorporate segments from those interviews into his programs. Here are some of his favorite memories. 
You know, the most famous of all radio shows was the War of the Worlds broadcast with Orson Welles. This is what Mr. Welles told me. Now, when you and Howard Koch and the rest of the staff were putting the show together, did you say, well, this will really get them, this will really scare the pants off of everybody? Yes, but we didn't think it would get them that much or that many. Uh -huh. You know, this was uh, done for the benefit of a certain lunatic fringe. <laughs> we did realize the uh, extent of the fringe, which included some good friends of mine. Fred Foy was the most famous announcer of The Lone Ranger. For, for our golden days of radio audience, would you do the opening of that show you did for so many years? <laughs> All right, Frank. A fiery horse with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty high of silver. The Lone Ranger. We're in Mae West's glamorous apartment in Hollywood. And may I say it's a pleasure to be here. Mm, glad you made it. <laughs> may, your pictures of the 30s were considered scandalous then, and you helped to bring on censorship. Do you think that there, there should be censorship for adult entertainment? Yes, intelligent uh, censorship. One has to draw the line somewhere. Jack, you're the, the perennial 39-year-old, but of course that, that isn't your true age. How old are you really? Well, I'm not saying this time. All I know is that last year, with all the candles burning on the cake, there were several anxious calls from forest rangers. Frank Brzee was not the first one to play old radio, but he was the first one to do it with finesse and with panache and with style and with love for the medium. Frank enjoyed people a great deal, loved to talk to people, and so when he began to do the golden days of radio, he'd call on people and they'd all want to do his show. There was something you did on the show better than anybody else, either anybody has ever done on radio, and that's uh, the alliteration or the tongue twister spot. Well, I've got one of those, uh, oh, and good. this is my favorite. This is from uh, uh, November 1948. Do you want to try it? Do you think you oh, can yes, you're I up to it? Oh, yes, I remember well. Okay. Yeah. Let's see if we can do it. <laughs> Frank, did I ever tell you about the time I got some batter in my eye when I was beating up a batch of bakery at the Bakersfield Bakery? No, you never told me you worked in a bakery. I never told you about the time at Bakersfield when I was beating batter for the bakery? You never did? Well, Brazy, stand well back. You see, the Bakersfield Bakery used big batches of batter for bacon, and they liked their batter beat with butter. Now, some of the batter beaters beat some awful bitter batter, but the batter I beat made better beaten batches, and boy, I beat barrel after barrel of batter. We had as about a beat up a bunch of bakers as ever balled up a batch of batter, but the reason my batter was better was on account of because I beat my batter with a platter, which made a better bladder, splattered the platter, scattered the batter, sputtered the butter, buttered the platter, and beat the bajunior out of the Me gee. <laughs> yeah. That's enough. Okay. We've got to pause for this commercial. Frank Brzee had tremendous success in the world of radio, but his greatest financial rewards came from the game industry. He designed several adult board games similar to Monopoly. Pass Out was by far the most popular, and through the years it has sold over six million copies around the world. Frank had also created board game versions of television shows that were popular at the time. The Family Game, the newlywed game, and the dating game. But his work with television was not limited to simple game design. Frank and his partner Gary Smith had worked with Ralph Edwards Productions to supervise merchandising for several of his shows, including Truth or Consequences. They would provide promotional support for product manufacturers and help secure prizes for contestants. And when Frank wasn't working on game shows at the network studios, he could be found working at his personal home theater and stage, commonly known as the Hudson House. He once hosted a young Monty Hall and his development partner, Steve Hadis, to help support early run-throughs for their new show that would later become Let's Make a Deal. For many years thereafter, Frank would create other game show ideas and would bring in aspiring actors to his home theater to help work on the pilots. Among those were a young Alex Trebek and Vanna White. 
Well, the first time I went to Frank's house to do these game shows, we're talking 1980, so it wasn't scary like it is today. You wouldn't just show up, but back then it was different. And I showed up, he was so friendly and warm and amazing, so passionate about game shows. I was very happy to be part of that and I'm thinking, maybe I can make it big. This is great, this is the first step. And I, it was only positive stuff and so good. A few years later, Vanna was selected to co-host Wheel of Fortune, and she's been a shining star on that show ever since. I have to give Frank the credit for me being on Wheel of Fortune. He was the person that started me out in game shows, even though it was just run-throughs, but it just, it was perfect, it was perfect. He is the guy who started it all for me. After learning her trade at Frank's home theater, Vanna took part in a much-loved Hudson House tradition. She was asked to autograph the talent chalkboard that rested above the fireplace. Next to her signature was Dick Clark's and George Jessel's. Elvis Presley, Monty Hall, and Jimmy Durante also signed the board, along with many, many others. Among Frank's numerous collections, he was quite pleased of his signature board of celebrities that visited his home. for you now is another piece of radio history. Amos and Andy came from this studio... Through the years, Frank appeared on a number of TV programs to help educate and inform viewers of the history of the radio medium. This is a picture of Freeman Gosden and Charles Carell who played... One of his shining achievements came in 1977 when he produced and hosted an Emmy-nominated TV show that celebrated the golden days of radio. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Tinsel Tonsil Bill Baldwin. <laughs> you know, this is an exciting night for me, but then opening nights usually are for everyone. Radio, radio. The golden days of radio, radio. Don't touch that dial. No, you have the audience in the palm of your hand. Yeah, it'll give you an idea how many people are in the audience. Uh, <laughs> you know, you have great comedy material, too. Do you write it yourself? Of course. Yeah. Of course, there's a lot of rumors going around that I steal jokes from other comedians. It's just not true. Yeah, I've, uh, I've heard those rumors, too, but I never did believe them. I'm glad. As a matter of fact, I... Just the other way around, you see, most people steal lines from me. They do? Certainly they do. Yeah? They certainly do. Even you stole some of my lines for the special here. I, I did? Which ones? Well, didn't you, at the opening of the show, say, thank you, ladies and gentlemen? Yes. That's my line. <laughs> yeah, but... <laughs> There's another. Yeah, but... <laughs> and, and didn't you say when you introduced me, our next guest is one of the funniest men on radio? Yes. <laughs> It's one of my lines, too. Uh, they didn't tell me that. Listen, Frank. Yeah? Uh, do, do you still have those pages uh, from the Jack Benny script for next week? Well, yeah, I do, Milton, but, but why? I to look them over, you see. I want to make sure that he isn't stealing any of my material. Uh, see what I, I mean? see, well, I got the script right here. Yeah? Yeah. Let me see this. He did. You're kidding. Stole my biggest joke. What's that? Well... Are you or are you not going to loan me your bicycle? Well, I'll tell you, Bergen. I'll let you have it tomorrow. Oh, but tonight I'm, I have to take my girl riding on the handlebars. Oh, I see. Well, one thing, Charlie, you can't stop in Lover's Lane and then say that you're out of gas. <laughs> no, no, you can't. But uh, you can always say that you're too pooped to pedal. <laughs> <laughs> You fellas certainly work well together. Well, thank you. I thought Bergen was a little wooden. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's been a real pleasure being on your show, Frank, but uh, I'll have to hurry along now. Oh, yeah, you afraid you'll miss your plane to Sun City? No, no. <laughs> what is the rush, Edgar? Well, uh, Charlie has an appointment with his doctor this afternoon. Oh, well, I hope it's nothing serious. Oh, no, it's just a little skin rash, you know. It's nothing that uh, sandpaper can't get rid of. <laughs> Uh, good night, Frank. Yeah. Good, good night, night folks. Yes. <laughs>
In addition to his TV specials, Frank produced radio specials recognizing Denver station KOA's 50th anniversary and Los Angeles station KFI's 50th anniversary. The ambitious golden anniversary special for Southern California's KFI was the most challenging. Frank used his vast resources to assemble numerous celebrities who would each host a portion of this massive 12-hour radio special. As much as Frank loved his work in radio and TV, he was always missing that special someone to share his life with. That all changed when he met Bobby. It was in 1972 and I met Frank at a Piner Broadcaster meeting. And I was a Playboy bunny at the time and they needed some girls to come over and wait some of the tables. So I had Frank's table. And uh, I went over to get his drink order and he said, I'll have uh, uh, a cavassier. And I said, well, not until you eat your peas. And he looked at me stunned because who says that? You don't say things like that, especially when you're delivering drinks. So I came back a few minutes later. He said, I have a game company and I'd like you to model for my game company. I said, sure you would. So I said, I tell you what, he says, I'd like to get your number. And I said, well, I don't do that, but I'll take your number. And he gave me his number. And I went home to my mother who said, did you meet anybody today? And I said, yeah. This one guy was really nice. And he said he wanted me to be a model. And I said, yeah. She said, for what? And I said, I don't know. He has some kind of a game company called Pass Out. So mom got up from the table, ran back to the bedroom, came back out, and in her hand she said, you mean this game? And I said, oh my God, Mom, what are you doing with Pass Out? She goes, this is a great game. I went, I think I better check into this guy because he must be pretty famous. And so Bobby made that call to Frank and their love story began. Frank and Bobby spent the next 45 years together, laughing and loving one another and enjoying all that life had to offer. Well, Franklin and Bobby were, first of all, a beautiful couple. And they, I think from probably day one that they saw each other and met, they fell in love. Well, it was one of the true, romantic, beautiful, relationships. Frank and Bobby were always one of the most fun couples to be around, especially Bobby because she has a tendency to laugh a whole lot whether you're funny or not. Franklin was always so proud of her, proud of not only her beauty, but of her kindness, of her sweetness, and they had good times together. What did I love about Frank? Everything. He was smart, he was good looking, he was so much fun, and we went traveling together, and we loved the same thing, we loved the same food, it was just perfect. Most of all, he was so generous, he was generous with everybody besides me, he was generous with all his friends, and I, I love the story of Dr. Ravon in the piano. On one of my visits to the Hudson house, I, uh, I saw this piano in the living room, and I was kind of toying with it and playing and I was talking to Frank. I said, oh, this is a beautiful piano. He said, if you ever want to sell this piano, please let me know. I, I would love to, have, to buy this piano from you. Um, and he asked me, he says, who plays piano in your house? I said, oh, my daughter plays. A few months later, he asked me, when is your daughter's birthday? And I said, June 18. And I, th I was wondering, what, what was that all about? So on June 18th that year, in 2003, he, he had this piano buffed and tuned and delivered to my house as a present to my daughter. She was so excited, she was so happy. And she plays it up until now. Every day she comes back from work, she sits at the piano and plays it. He never forgot people who helped him out. And he had a, go a heart of gold, and, and he, 
he always appreciated what you did for him. In, in, in thanking you in, in, in gifts and, and it was, he was a, a very giving and, and very uh, uh, appreciative person. Frank stayed involved with and shared his passion for radio throughout his entire life, despite having suffered from three strokes in his later years. For over five decades, he was an active member of the Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters Organization and served as the group's president for a short time. He loved participating with old-time radio organizations and being part of their radio recreations. Carlos! Oh, Carlos! Dexter, is that you? Yeah, it's me, Corliss. Can I talk to you for one little minute? I have a big problem, and it's got me super mixed up, and I don't know how to deal with it. I'm confused. I don't know how to say it. Oh, Dexter, you can say anything to me. What is it, Dexter? Gee, Corliss, you're the most understanding girl a guy ever knew. Oh, come on. Come on, Dexter. You can confide in me. What can I do for you? Oh, uh, there's a lot you can do for me. <laughs> Remember, there's With friends of old-time radio, Spurvac, yes, and Reps, yes. Frank acted in and directed some of their shows. You know, this is the 75th anniversary. Of he also Rome gave Richard. talks at several of their functions. 75 years ago. Uh, and you know, nobody, nobody has spoken about uh, mistakes in live radio because we weren't allowed to make mistakes. And over the years, I did 2,360 shows, something like that. And I enjoyed every minute of it. And I enjoy being here, and I thank you, and I hope you catch some of the other shows tonight and tomorrow. In 1998, Frank collaborated with fellow radio enthusiast and illustrator Bob Lines to create an entertaining book that featured hundreds of famous radio celebrities and shows from the golden era. Frank called me one afternoon uh, at work and said, uh, I've got an idea. I remember Ripley's Believe It or Not? He said, maybe we could do something like that about radio, old time radio. I'll write the thing, you do the artwork, and uh, we'll split it. And we did Abbott and Costello all the way to yours truly, Johnny Dollar. In 2002, Frank teamed up with Walden Hughes to co-host and produce a live internet radio program called The Friday Night Show. That program can still be heard today on the Yesterday USA Radio Network as Walden continues to honor Frank and share his lifelong collection of memories. Thank to Frank and Bob Holt, Jimmy Durante. I don't think people in the future, unless they're true historical buffs about the radio business or the television business, will understand what an important part Frank was. Those who know, know. As an archivist, as a historian, I, uh, you know, that, that's, he set the standard, I think, as far as presenting old time radio with respect and, and honoring it. The preservation of radio shows is important. We all agree with that, and it's true. The hobby preserves radio shows. But of equal importance is the radio history of the people who worked on the shows. Frank was passionate about that. That's why the golden days of radio lasted from 1949 on. And that's why we can't let this slip away. We have to preserve it and make people aware what a wonderful uh, Avenue Radio was because you uh, you listened and you imagined and you don't imagine much anymore with television. You could uh, dress the Lone Ranger any way you wanted to. You could visualize what the shadow looked like. Your imagination would set the scene and you could, uh, you could make all kinds of worlds in your mind. We all sat around and watched the radio. I say I use the word watched for a purpose. The pictures were far more vivid than television, movies, or anything else. We enjoyed it. This is a part of our history that will never, ever happen again. 
Frank understood that the world of radio was changing. His life's pursuit of collecting old-time radio programs and showcasing its stars would be coming to an end. But he was determined to preserve and protect his vast collection for future generations by donating it to the Thousand Oaks Library Foundation. Today, it is believed to be America's greatest private collection of radio memorabilia. It includes over 10,000 scripts, 8 million feet of audio tape, over 1,000 unpublished photographs of radio personnel, and one very special item affectionately called the Radio Oscar. This is Radio's Oscar, and it was invented by Cecil B. DeMille. It's one of a kind, and uh, it was used on the Lux Radio Theater for about 15 years. The problem with the stars that appeared on Lux Radio Theater, they were very nervous and they wanted something to hold on to. <laughs> the mic was hung in the center of the Oscar, kept them the proper distance from the mic. And this is a great piece of radio memorabilia. Always the showman and educator, Frank was happy to share yet another piece of radio trivia. And as his friends remember, it was always with a laugh and a smile. But because of establishments like the Thousand Oaks Library and the Thousand Oaks uh, Foundation, the memories of radio will live in our hearts and our minds forever. Thank you. I think his attitude about life was so positive. He never was, was down, he was never disappointed. Every time I would see him, I asked him, Frank, how are you doing? He would smile and say, great. That was him, great. I was lucky enough to work with Frank on his shows and be invited to do things with him and share a little bit of the glory of Frank Brzee and radio. I don't think I know anybody who was involved in so many things from such a young age, so many different variations of show business and, and, and broadcasting, so many different things. It's amazing when you stop to think about it. I'll never forget the memorable times with my buddy, Frank Brzee. Writer, producer, director, actor, inventor, he was Mr. Radio.